I'm Stacy Sorrell, and I'm a senior strategist for Borshoff's Employee Engagement Practice Group. And I've actually been helping clients raise awareness for cybersecurity for the last eight years um, and uh, have actually worked with both of our special guests. So um, I know they know their stuff and I'm excited for them to be with us today. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about why we're here today. Um, I'm sure most of you, if you're joining today, know that October, there's a month for everything and October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So why is this month important? So according to a global brokerage firm, Willis Towers and Watson, nearly 90% of successful cyber attacks are due to client error. So it's important that we educate our employees on what these risk factors are. And our two special guests today are going to talk to us about what those risks are and, and how those have been elevated during this work from home movement and what tactics we can use to engage our, this, this virtual workforce that we have today. So first I'm gonna introduce Sonia. So with more than 25 years of experience in both agency and corporate communications, Sonia Pops Daly has been leading information security communications at Eli Lilly and Company for the past five years. In this role, with, which primarily focuses on internal communications, Sonia develops strategic plans and campaigns to drive workforce education, engagement, and risk-based behavior on a variety of security topics and initiatives. She leads Cybersecurity Awareness Month planning, including speaker events and experiential learning opportunities, which she'll talk a little bit about today. She's also a member of the National Cybersecurity Alliance's Marketing Committee, and she's spoken on cybersecurity communications at a national and statewide level. Her work in cybersecurity has won numerous awards. So thanks for joining us today, Sonia. Thank Next, you for I'd me. like to introduce Erin Pritz. Aaron Pritz is the CEO and co-founder of Reveal Risk, a boutique and specialized cybersecurity, privacy, and risk management consulting practice, where he and his team have helped companies better address risk, optimize their focus, and enhance their maturity. So Aaron has more than 20 years of experience focused on information security, technology, privacy, and risk management. Aaron is creative thinking strategist with the ability to bring strategies to life with countless examples and successful execution. So thank you both again for lending your time to us this morning. And I'm going to open us up with a few questions to get us started. But again, if anyone has any questions, please again use the, the raise your hand function or put something in the chat. So I'm going to start with you, Aaron. So we heard in our last um, Borshoff chat session with Bob Schultz from Downtown Indy that we've gone from a staggering 155,000 people coming downtown to work on a daily basis to 20,000. Um, I assume that this high percentage uh, is due to the COVID work from home environment. So what new risks are company experiencing as a result of this shift to working from home that should be a focus of employee education? Yeah, great, great question, Stacy. So, um, and I've got a slide here that I'll talk about in a bit, but let me talk first about the variety of impact that we've seen across the different sectors. So uh, from where Sonia and I both worked and Sonia continues to work, Lily, Lily had a pretty remote workforce that we all had laptops for years, there were VPNs, there were processes. Uh, a couple other of our clients in very different industries um, had uh, really no work from home culture, uh, especially when you get into industries like the De Department of Defense contractors, uh, maybe aerospace and defense, because they're handling top secret or classified data. Uh, by nature, there was no culture of work from home. And that's just one example. There's other industries that obviously weren't set up for that. So there was a lot of scrambling that happened, um, I would say, in the first two to six weeks, depending on how fast companies were able to move to get even the basic technology from laptops to a VPN that you can sign in to, to remote connectivity um, for big companies that have had this for a variety of reasons, just flexibility, uh, kind of take it for granted. But a lot of the, the mid-sized companies, especially, or sectors that weren't used to that, really had a, a rude awakening to scramble. So with that, the scrambling, anytime you need to go fast, sometimes you can cut corners, not necessarily intentionally, when you're setting up technology, routers, uh, Zoom meetings. We all unfortunately heard about the, the Zoom bombing, you know, basic things like having a password and, and things like that, that maybe weren't, uh, uh, they, were, they were afterthoughts versus uh, things that we were thinking ahead of. 
And even things like um, HR policies, does the expectations of employees need to change when you are now no longer in a confined workspace with physical security parameters and understanding who's coming in and out? Um, I think that the biggest thing that probably affected every company, regardless of their readiness, was uh, increased use of personal devices, uh, whether it's your home desktop, your home laptop, maybe you've got that slick new Mac that your company hasn't bought you, but you bought for yourself as a splurge, uh, as well as like cloud storage and sharing. You know, you may use Dropbox uh, for your kids' uh, soccer league to, to coordinate with parents. And, you know, all of a sudden you start taking the conveniences of personal life and maybe aren't as diligent as you were when working in the work setting. Uh, there are luckily answers for all of that. And a lot of that comes through education. Um, we've learned over the years, and it's uh, been an evolution of thinking in cybersecurity, is you can't block everything that's bad. You can try. It won't go well. Uh, you'll probably have uh, an attempt where you end up blocking a lot of good stuff in addition to the things you don't want to happen. So it's really always a balance. You can try to you know, prevent things from happening, um, but also um, employees are the, the, and the workforce in general, whether you're an employer or a contractor, you're really that, that, that best line of defense or last line of defense. If you can't prevent it from happening, you need to make sure that the people that are handling your sensitive data and privacy data of the, you know, the customers that you serve every day, make sure that they know what they're doing, they're best informed and they can, and they can avoid inadvertent mistakes for the most part. Uh, first, we'll talk about the themes, and then in a later question, I think I can get into some of the, the real examples. I've got some screenshots of things I received personally, and some that I found from others that they were seeing. So obviously, we've all unfortunately gotten familiar with the topic of phishing and social engineering. Uh, I would say email <laughs> phishing has been the most popular, but uh, really text message, uh, trying to get people to click links on smartphones, whether it be iPhone or an Android, that's really uh, raged up. Uh, companies have seen increases in malware during the pandemic. Um, uh, there were, uh, I don't have the exact stats, but it was like a 900% uh, growth of domain registrations related to pandemic related topics. And most of those were malicious. So people trying to capitalize on the unfortunate disruption that the pandemic caused. Uh, and then also obviously increase in remote workers, but also if you think about protecting it within an office now you've got you know, you've got specific infrastructure and computers and all of that that you deal with. Now you've got a bigger variety over a, a, a wider space with different levels of connection that people have in. Um, so those are just some of the things that come up. And again, uh, some of it's technical solution, but a lot of it is just uh, helping people understand what they need to do, what they need to defend, and how to work and act differently. And I think we'll see an evolution in this as you know, I think remote work will still have a, a, a more predominant uh, focus going forward, even as the, uh, hopefully the, uh, the uh, uh, antidote is, is found, but, but also I think the cultures need to change and the, and the continued education will need to uh, keep ramping up to make sure that people can, can evolve with, this, with, with everyone on this together. And speaking of that, Sonia, I know we've talked about how this work from home movement that employees are webinared out. You know, there are lots of things like like this that we're participating in today and, and people are tired of being on their computer all day. So how is that changing how you're approaching your cybersecurity awareness month activities for your virtual workforce? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, the whole webinar, I feel like this whole work from home movement has definitely triggered a lot of organizations, whether it's the company you work for or just other organizations that you might be involved with, you know, for professional developments and, and whatnot. Uh, I think everyone's been jumping on like, let's do a webinar on this, on this and this. And I feel like every other day I'm getting some sort of email that's telling me about some sort of webinar, and many of them are actually very relevant to what I would be interested in hearing about, um, but I, I'm just uh, definitely webinared out uh, between my own company and, and outside organizations. And I don't know if it's that organizations are assuming that because we're, so many of us are working from home that we have more free time, because I see a lot of articles uh, kind of taking that angle that, you know, now that you're at home, you know, what here's like new hobbies you can pick up. But to the contrary, I feel like between myself and some other people I, I speak with, we don't have more free time working from home. In fact, a lot of us are working more hours working from home, so we don't necessarily have all this extra free time to be joining 
webinars. Um, but for Cybersecurity Awareness Month, uh, which, by the way, was launched uh, back in 2004 by the National Cybersecurity Alliance and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, uh, this will be um, my fourth year uh, and, and my company's fourth year um, doing Cybersecurity Awareness Month in, in terms of actually having a plan set of activities uh, during October. And so with most of us uh, still working from home, uh, we did make the call that we are doing everything virtually this year. And, um, and that does include doing some webinars. Uh, we're going to have a kickoff event um, and a few other things, but I want to be very mindful of our employees' time and I don't want to uh, put too many things up on people's calendars because I think we just won't get the participation that we would like. So I think less is more, so to speak. So, um, so being mindful of, of those uh, calendars, I'm looking at really just having one event, so to speak, per week. So the first full week of October, we'll have a kickoff event with a, an outside speaker. And then for weeks two, three, and four, uh, we'll do um, just once a week, uh, we'll have some sort of lunch and learn or morning coffee. Uh, again, it will be virtual. Um, but again, just trying to be mindful of calendars and not put too many on the calendar. And then also um, just understanding that people may not want to or be able to even devote one hour a week <clears throat> during October um, we'll also do like uh, recaps. So after we have a session, um, I have a cybersecurity news feed on our intranet. And uh, so I can publish an article after we do one of our sessions that um, is a, a recap of the key takeaways. And we're also planning on having a very short recap video of those key takeaways. So it's taking that information and, and delivering it to employees in different ways. Um, and then also, um, uh, we're looking at other creative ways to uh, to do cybersecurity awareness month in, in the virtual setting so that it's not just, you know, webinars, so to speak. Uh, so this year we're going to be doing a virtual escape room. So I'm very excited about that. That's going to be very different. Um, it will be, you know, interactive opportunity where employees can get teams together uh, and then join in this virtual escape room experience, which will be moderated by a member of our information security team. So that's another way that we are uh, looking at cybersecurity awareness month this year um, in a more virtual environment. Great. Thanks, Sonia. So Erin, another question for you. What are some of the scariest scams that you've been seeing that businesses are experiencing right now, but also personally? So when we, we can get employees' attention by sharing information that can benefit them personally, we've seen that work in the past. So what are some of the scariest scams that you're seeing right now? Yeah. So while we're pulling up the slide, I would say in general with a workforce awareness program, the more real examples, real to the company, real to the senior leaders, real in general, uh, that you can share, the more it will resonate. I feel like a lot of times there's some conservative thinking of, oh, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to share an example of something that's inactive or it was involved in an employee, even if we don't name the employee. But my big belief is if people will not realize that it's true and real, unless you can be as overt as possible. Um, so it really helps to get a really good partnership with your legal team and privacy team to get on the same page to be able to do that. So with that, and this, these examples really focus on things that I saw or uh, collected from others uh, specific to the pandemic. So we'll start on the left. So smishing, SMS uh, phishing essentially, is a way to get coerce somebody through a, a text unsolicited for the most part um, that will force you to click a link or sometimes open a, an image with a pixel or, or something that uh, is intended to either get you to go to a site and perform an action or in certain cases i know we've always hoped and felt the iphone is more resilient to some of the 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 malware as the, the android um, but that's not that's not been proven to be 100%. So regardless of which phone you carry, um, these things are real and becoming more popular. So the one on the left here, uh, and I've changed the names to protect the, well, let's just say guilty. Uh, the, the first <laughs> spammer uh, talked about, you know, they were trying to capture people's attention through positive results on testing. Uh, so claim a free sample for your family. This was back in, gosh, maybe March or April when testing was pretty scant. Um, so, and then the next one, hi, Campbell, no one will be safe from the coronavirus anymore. The only, uh, this is the only survivor guide. So this is getting you to click on a survival guide. Like who doesn't want to help your friends and family 
um, with best practices. It's kind of like uh, the bad version of this, uh, this chat here. If, if the intent was to scam you, uh, which it's not, by the way, uh, uh, then, then obviously you'd want to make something that's relevant, and that's what this scammer did here. I won't go through all of these, but we're talking about masks and getting, getting supplies. All of these were malicious. And then on Aaron. the bottom, um, it's uh, actually a phone scam. So, and I had a couple of these on voicemail, but again, more trying to get free testing, press one, blah, 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 if you want the free testing, which convert you to the social engineer that's gonna convince you to do whatever their, their game is, whether it's collect your credit card number, a social security number to get that free sample, et cetera, et cetera. This middle one um, was actually one that I received. So I redacted my email there to protect my privacy. Um, but uh, a lot of small businesses were going through the PPP loan situation when kind of business ground to a halt during lockdown. So a big scam was to send out uh, information to open a file to sign because most small businesses that were going through this pandemic were registering to receive the PPP to cover their salaries, to be able to keep uh, people employed. So uh, a great example of kind of using fear uh, and speed to action to get somebody to fall for it. Um, and then I'll, I won't talk about all these, but just social, social media. A lot of people don't think about phishing and social media, but it's a definite vector. A lot of them seem like discounts. A lot of the sites that you go to for these crazy deals of 90% off, I would definitely uh, go to the website directly, not use the link, because a lot of them just pivot you to a scam site. Um, so it's really important to kind of regardless of where you're interacting in the digital and in some cases from a phone standpoint, uh, the, the human, just be, be vigilant, be, uh, understand that every, you know, if it's too good to be true, you should at minimum ask some questions, um, but also know that these things are trying to capture your attention when you're when you're at your weakest or when you're most anxious. Um, so uh, I, I can foresee and guarantee that for every world crisis, including pandemics, the scammers are going to up their game and, and really tailor stuff to try to resonate. Uh, the more clicks they get, the more uh, money or identities, money they steal, identities they take. Uh, so those are just a few examples. And we'll, we'll move to more positive questions here in a bit. Sorry to have to hear all the <laughs> negative. <laughs> and I was just going to say, Aaron, you mentioned the, the rise in um, texting. Uh, and I personally have seen that in the past year. Uh, I've got both a personal phone and a work phone. They're both iPhones. And I cannot believe how many um, phishing uh, att attacks I'm getting through my uh, text messaging. And if that's an important Part to educate your employees about because you know a lot of organizations spend a lot of time uh, educating employees on phishing emails and how to spot those emails but as Aaron was saying there's definitely phishing happening through other means and uh, I personally have seen a lot of it happening through text but also uh, the voice phishing you know the old-fashioned phone calls that uh, people are still uh, doing and then uh, the social engineering as Aaron said as well. Yeah one yeah, personal this... thing make sure that you um, talk to your, if you have older parents or grandparents, talk mm -hmm. to them. I you know I've shared this with uh, Stacy and Sonia over the years, but my wife's uh, grandmother on her mother's side, um, you know, as a lot of older people are, was suffering full, from Alzheimer's and dementia. And she fell prey over a period of eight years, even with um, doctor intervention, lawyer intervention, you know, people trying to convince her. Um, but it was one of the, um, uh, the, the scams to try to get people to wire funds. You call call typically an elderly person and try to convince them that they've either won a prize or or something. If they if they send you know a thousand dollars, they'll they'll receive more. So personal story, she uh, pretty much gave up their entire life savings over a period of time, uh, and they eventually took away her uh, f you know financial freedom basically to stop it. Um, but definitely uh, make sure your your elderly parents and grandparents are in the know about this and when help them monitor for, for this type of stuff. Yeah, about yeah. that with, on the personal front is, especially with this pandemic is, um, you know, scammers are, they're, they're looking at obituaries as well. So they're looking at who's passing away and then they might do a uh, specific targeting to the widow or widower. Um, and, you know, assuming that they, you know, they can tell from the obituary what general age range the person who passed is and, and figure out oh, that, you know, the, the widow or widower might be a senior citizen and might be uh, more susceptible to falling for a scam. Um, and I personally, uh, my father just passed away 
in April. Um, it had nothing to do with the pandemic, with COVID, but he did pass away. And I've told my mother, you know, now that once the obituary is out there, you could be targeted for scams as well. So scams can be very uh, blanket scams uh, that lots of people get and they're not very personalized, but then uh, scammers also uh, do research like that and they can really uh, tailor stuff to their targets as well. All right, Stacey, no more scary scams. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about fixing Sorry. it from here on out. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's awful. And I know, Sonia, you're going to share later some resources. So you mentioned having these conversations. So the National Cybersecurity Alliance actually has a website where folks can go and actually get some resources that they could share with family and friends, you know, because those are, those are hard conversations to have, like you said, with the elderly when, I mean, that's their freedom and you don't want to take things away. But, but Aaron, you mentioned social media and that is a scary thing. And right now, you know, as a lot of people are working from home and on their devices nonstop, social media is, I'm sure, a big target, as you mentioned. So in addition to social media, what are the top three things, Aaron, that people should do to keep themselves safe at home? Because we know when they learn safe behaviors at home, they'll bring those safe behaviors to work. Yeah, great point. So we, um, as everything was being disrupted, we put out several resources, and uh, I'd be happy to share those, Stacy, um, after afterwards to send out in the notes. But Okay. Uh, the first one we did, we started with, um, because that, yeah, schools were closing and such, so we put out an infographic for internet safety for kids, and the, the National Cybersecurity uh, Awareness Resources might have some things as well, but we took um, kind of the six things that resonated most, most for us, um, and I won't go through all of them, but uh, it has to do with uh, making sure you understand the right privacy settings for the apps and systems and software that your kids are using, um, discussing internet safety with them, uh, being able to review or approve what your kids are doing online. I recently invested in the Circle. It was originally by Disney. Um, now I think it's separated, but it's a it's a device and it's a app that you and your spouse or your family members can use. It goes on all the devices. It allows you to block the content that you want. But most importantly, for the overconsumption of digital in this in this current time, it allows you to set limits for your kids and time out. It uh, cleverly, uh, most of the time works, but it allows them to finish the game they're on before it boots them. Uh, and then they, of course, beg you for more time. But that's a whole other uh, uh, shop chat uh, of how to <laughs> avoid that. Uh, and then and then also like devices out in the open, you know, you want to make sure that if they're, if they're interacting with a bully or um, somebody that you don't want them to, that they're not uh, uh, away from you, and, and you can kind of catch that if it happens. Uh, there's, some, uh, there's some other tips on keeping their identity safe and then making sure that they know um, no downloading without parental approval, and you can set up some settings on that. And the other infographic that we created is more for the workplace. It was called Cy Keeping Cyber Safe in a Virtual Workplace. This um, Some of it resonates at home, but uh, it talks the themes on that, and, and again, I'll share the resource. Be smart with your data, know the information, know your information and what's sensitive, protect your environment, both digitally and um, physically, uh, beware of scams and attackers, which is what we just covered, and then communicate and share smartly. So as you're thinking about what you're sharing over email or, or files, and then learn and adapt is kind of the, you know, this is a moving target here, so what, what we publish you know, three months ago, uh, I think there's still some relevance, but uh, it's it's definitely evolving as technology changes and, and tools and techniques of the bad guys change. Great. Another thing um, about working from home and just being and being more safe and secure at home, um, there's a lot of just basic things that I guess I didn't really even realize myself until I started working in the cybersecurity space five years ago. But uh, you know, we have wireless routers at home. It's amazing how many people don't change the default password on their wireless router. And, and my family is, is guilty before I learned that that's something you should do. We would have AT&T, they'd give us a router and we just use whatever default password was on the router when they installed it and never changed it. And I'm not sure even back then we would have known how to change it, <laughs> um, but I've, I've learned that that is a big no-no. So, you know, these, these standard passwords on wireless routers are out there on the web and hackers can easily get to those. So, so that's another way to stay safe at home is be sure that, um, that you change default passwords on wireless routers and, and other devices. And having that guest access is something else that I've learned. We didn't have mm -hmm. that set up here at home, but having a, a guest password that your guests can use so they're not 
getting the same access that that you are. Exactly. So Sonia, we've talked about how you are a member of the National Cybersecurity Alliance Marketing Committee. So what are some of the most effective things that you've either experienced at Lilly or that you've seen through some of the conferences that you've attended to use to educate employees on, on scams like we just talked about? Absolutely. I think um, as Aaron was mentioning, uh, you know, the, the real life examples are really fantastic to show. So all of those examples that, that Aaron showed um, are, are great because it really, uh, it, it takes it from, you know, that, oh, they're just paranoid about, you know, things that might happen to, you know, this stuff really does happen to people. If you can share that it actually has happened at your company, uh, you know, different, uh, there's different levels of, um, I guess, comfort on how much you share about what may, have, may or may not have happened at your own company, but even sharing outside examples. So, and then bringing newsworthy things. So Aaron had all of these great recent examples of different types of attacks through text and email and, and phone that are related to this pandemic. Um, so that's very timely. So, you know, the topic of um, educating employees about uh, phishing and social engineering and how not to fall for that, that's that's been around for years and years and years, but to have the recent examples, um, I think it's one way that you can, you know, really uh, educate employees is, is, and make it more effective. Um, but in terms of, uh, especially during the times where a lot of uh, us are working from home still, uh, I'm, I'm pretty networked with the security awareness community. And, and that's actually a, a phrase that I learned when I started working in this space is security awareness. That's kind of the industry uh, terminology for those of us who work in cybersecurity, doing communications and education and training and, and those things. So it's, it's labeled as security awareness, but I'm involved in, in some out, outside communities related to that. And what I've seen uh, this year in particular, uh, out, online scavenger hunts are really, really popular. I know a lot of companies nationwide are doing online scavenger hunts for cybersecurity, uh, not just uh, next month for Cybersecurity Awareness Month, but they have already been doing those. Um, I actually participated in an online uh, uh, scavenger hunt for cybersecurity for, uh, related to a conference, an industry conference, and I really enjoyed it. And it's there's a lot of ways you can make it very educational. So the different steps I was doing through the scavenger hunt gave me a lot of cybersecurity tips and information. So I was learning as I was playing. Uh, so that uh, is definitely a popular uh, tactic. And then I mentioned that we're going to be doing an online escape room this year. Uh, those are also very popular. I know quite a few companies who are doing online escape rooms. Last year, we actually did an in-person escape room that was very popular. Um, we're not able to replicate that this year because of so many of us still working from home. Um, but escape rooms are definitely popular. That goes back to that experiential learning that we talked about earlier and getting people more engaged. Uh, and uh, I've also know, um, I haven't personally done this, but I know quite a few companies are doing um, online crossword puzzles and word searches and even online coloring contests. And all of the content is related to cybersecurity and educating on cybersecurity information, um, but delivering it in, in a different way. So, you know, I think one of the keys is creating those more experiential learning opportunities for employees. Um, but we're also looking at other ways we can have more two-way conversations. So I mentioned earlier that on our intranet, I have a cybersecurity news feed. So I can publish uh, various articles and information related to cybersecurity. So that might be where I share some of the, you know, the latest coronavirus related uh, phishing scams that people should watch out for. Uh, but we also, in the past year, my company, we have uh, been migrating over to uh, with more Office 365 and we're really using the Yammer platform. So I have a cybersecurity uh, group uh, channel within our Yammer. And, uh, and that's really a great way that I can put, you know, very short blurbs of information that's very timely. It's also a good way for two-way communication. People might put cybersecurity related questions on our Yammer group and kind of crowdsource information. Our security team can respond, but others might respond as well. So, uh, so Yammer is a great way to, uh, to really enable some two-way conversation and, and what more timely and, and short bits of information. Um, and then also in the past, as a way to grab attention, uh, we've done a lot of really fun and entertaining videos related to cybersecurity and in a lot of those videos we used our senior leaders and employees really get a kick out of seeing you know a top executive in you know a video like that that's not you know kind of stayed and and uh, that's a little bit more entertaining and they loosen up a little bit uh, but we've also featured employees in 
a lot of our videos in the past as well. And we've made sure that the, it's a good representation of employees across, uh, you know, various business areas. And, you know, I think that help, helps elevate that share factor uh, when you see people you know in a video. So those are some other other ways that we've uh, tried to be creative and um, in reaching our employees related to cybersecurity, information and education, trying to help uh, change behavior, but in, in, in some different ways. And if anyone on the call has done anything that has been effective at your company or that you've seen maybe online that's been shared, please, again, raise your hand, put it in the chat. We love to, again, share ideas and best practices, that, especially those that have been effective for you. So please share. Um, Aaron, you mentioned earlier, you know, not, not everyone has the luxury of having someone dedicated to, to work on cybersecurity awareness in their company. So what can you tell small and mid-sized companies? What's a way that they can get started in building, building a cybersecurity awareness program? Yeah, so I'll start with the, the good and bad of, of awareness is there's, there's some um, companies out there or vendors uh, I, I won't name them, but there's four or five that are probably credible that create um, some basic training and, and allow you to do phishing campaigns, ethical phishing, where you simulate the experience of a real fish and then pivot that when they click or if they click uh, to a creative message. And I like these tools. I, I use these tools. Um, but my concern or the challenge is there's a lot of companies that think that that's it. Uh, so what you end up with is kind of commoditized training, some of it pretty good, decent, um, but then also uh, phishing campaigns. And I, I am a, I, it's a big pet peeve for me if you spend 90% of your time just phishing employees. Um, I think there can be a little bit of white noise that occurs and o over, I would, I would say overfishing, uh, where your, your company starts to believe that that's the only thing that they need to care about or that's all that security is really doing. Um, so I'm a big advocate in a diverse and, and, and balanced program. Uh, phishing, ethical phishing has its place. Um, but as I advise clients on how to get started, it really starts back to the business that you're in and understanding the data that you handle. Um, so one thing that, and I advocate, and, it, and the, the name of it can sound daunting, but data classification or information classification it comes out of a heritage of federal programs and there's definitely ways to make it federal and complicated and very hierarchical. But I think for small businesses, you got to keep it very basic. So we like to do some workshops with small businesses or mid-sized businesses or for, the la for that part, large companies to go, to go function by function and understand what, what's the worst thing that could happen if a hacker or an insider person that stole data, like what, what, what could you lose, uh, become disrupted or ransomware or manipulated from a data integrity standpoint and which things, which things matter the most? Because if you can use the 80, 20 rule to take 80% of your effort to focus on the top 20% of what matters most, you're going to have more success than trying to boil the ocean and have everyone trying to encrypt every single email or, encrypt every single file or be wary about sharing things that probably should be shared and aren't that sensitive. So I believe that with that upfront effort, you can actually go faster um, because you'll be more, more focused on what matters and it won't just feel like oh, everything's the same and everything's supposedly important, but we know it's not. I think from there, um, you want to make sure that the employees know how to identify within their own work environment and daily routine what they handle and what they need to do about it. So if it's, you know, a, an email with your lunch plans versus an email you're sending to a supplier with, you know, a recipe for a product uh, sample or something like that, um, two very different conditions and, and educating people on how to know the difference and then how to treat those things appropriately with very clear um, guidance of tools or processes that you want them to use. Uh, Sonia already hit on this a bit, but you've got to think about being clever um, in how you educate the employees. So again, there, you know, annual trainings are great uh, if done right. Uh, the, some of these bite-sized trainings you can get from some of the platforms that are available are great, but you need to resonate with the business you're in, the real people example, like employees and leaders. They need to know that you just didn't buy something off the shelf and push it out. And even though it looks 
a little snazzy, like, is it really that relevant here? You've got to connect them with what your business is doing, what your leaders care about, and what you need the employees to know within their work environment. So my biggest takeaway is you got to take the best of both worlds. Uh, it, it, you know, and, and some of it is limited by budget, but there's, we're working with several nonprofits right now that we've, able to, we've been able to do some pretty clever things custom to their business on you know, more of a shoestring budget than what uh, you know, a Fortune 500 company could probably afford. I think at the beginning of your program, you got to develop a roadmap of what you want to do and really push those innovative examples um, that maybe get, get some, uh, some head turns or, man, I was not expecting the security group to send out a video. Um, without going into details, I'll say like involving senior leaders, one of the things we did with Orshoff uh, back in the day is create a CEO video and used a, a ping pong concept where the CEO and a character that we had created over a several year period were fighting a ping pong death match. And there was a lot of buildup and you know the, the peak to the story and then the wind down and all of that. Um, but people were not expecting it. And I think it was one of the highest viewed or it was the highest viewed video uh, with, on, with the history of the video platform. So you've got to think outside of the box. And we love partnering with firms like Aborshoff to um, help from that perspective, because uh, we're not the the creative experts, um, so we kind of line up with them. Sonia's lined up with them uh, from the work she does to, to really drive the the you know the right people into the right activities to help resonate with the employees. I was going to mention too. You were asking you know about with the small smaller businesses or medium sized businesses that may not have a lot of resources and and maybe are just kind of getting started in this space. Um, we mentioned the National Cybersecurity Alliance and CSA. They actually have a, a series of webinars about cybersecurity that are specifically aimed to small businesses and medium-sized businesses. And these are all free webinars that the NCSA is offering. So that's something else uh, that uh, is helpful for those businesses that may not have a, a deep program uh, or established program yet. I think I saw, since we talked about webinar burnout, there are also some cool creative videos as well. They're not tailored to the company, which, but I think it's better than nothing if you want, if you can use something that has a little humor or some dramatic elements to it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and that's where I think sometimes the, the videos that offer a, the bite-sized chunk of information, more of a one to two minute video, again, versus sitting in yeah. and expecting employees to watch an hour long webinar, um, you know, again, different employees like to get information in different ways. So offer them both ways. As Sonia mentioned, that's what she's planning to do this cybersecurity awareness month is offer, you know, the longer format, but then give those key takeaways. So at least, you know, that employees are, are walking away with something critical because they're, uh, it's obviously an important message. So, but offering it in, in a bite-sized chunk that people can consume and, and walk away with. And Sonia, you mentioned the National Cybersecurity Alliance. Do you want to go ahead and talk about the resources that they have available for Cybersecurity Awareness Month as well? Yeah, so um, there's two websites that I think would be great for folks to go to. Um, so the, the first one that the NCSA has is uh, staysafeonline.org. And, um, and what you'll see here on this screenshot, this is uh, the, the landing page specifically for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So you'll see at the bottom, they've got several tabs, you know, about the month, but uh, the theme for 2020, uh, and then getting involved, becoming a champion, um, and resources and events. So, uh, so there's lots of information uh, embedded within this uh, landing page for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. But staysafeonline.org in general um, has a lot of great information. So um, you can see at the top, there's a, you know, a resource library, which is uh, highlighted there in orange. Uh, and uh, there's Keep My Business Secure. So that is, again, it's more targeted to the smaller and medium-sized businesses. Um, and then um, in addition- and Sonia, do you have to be a member to get access to that? No, no, this okay. is all, all free resources. So it's fantastic right. for, like I said, for companies who, you know, maybe aren't as well resourced internally. Um, and then there's another uh, sister oh, site- Sonia, that, one quick thing become a champion, you see that down in the middle, because I had to do that for our company. If you do that, you'll get even more information unlocked, but all you do is register with your email. They don't spam you. It's just, uh, they'll send you the full resource packet specific to Cybersecurity Awareness Month. That's right, yeah. So being a champion is specific to the Cybersecurity Awareness Month, but the resource library at the top of the site is not 
Cybersecurity Awareness Month specific. It's just a broad array of resources across the board. Um, but there's uh, on top of that orange button, the resources library is a link to a sister site that they have called Stop, Think, Connect. Uh, so it's stopthinkconnect.org. And on that site, there's also a whole wealth of, uh, of materials that are free for, um, for organizations to use. There's tip sheets, there's videos, uh, there's flyers. Uh, they've got specific like mini campaigns. And within those mini campaigns, they've got taglines and posters and flyers and lots of things developed. So uh, between um, this uh, staysafeonline.org and the stopthinkconnect.org, both of those sites uh, through the NCSA have just a lot of free resources uh, and content that you can pull from so you're not starting from scratch. Yeah, I know the Stop, Think, Connect, they also have some checklists. So until, you know, these be behaviors become habit for employees, sometimes it's just nice to have a little checklist of things that you need to kind of keep top of mind and they, and they do have those resources available. Mm -hmm. So Sonia, you've talked about how this is the last question. And again, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, you know, you mentioned that Lily's been doing this for years. So how do you keep it relevant? As, as Aaron mentioned earlier, employees sometimes feel like, especially when you have an educational fishing program, they feel like, oh, I'm, I'm fished out, I'm, I'm tired of hearing this information. How do you keep the, the, the content fresh and keep employees engaged in this topic? Uh, and like we said earlier, I've been leading cybersecurity communications uh, for the past five years, but our uh, security awareness um, communications program has been in, in place uh, for several years before I joined. So it's been around for quite a while um, compared to a lot of other companies who may have more relatively young programs in this space. Um, but I think it's just, it's really important to try to embed a security mindset um, into the culture of your organization. Uh, it's really, really easy for employees to think that cybersecurity is IT's job. And there's certainly, you know, the part of securing our IT systems and the, te uh, the technology aspect of that. So obviously IT has a, has a big part um, of cybersecurity. But as you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, a lot of cyber attacks happen because of human error. And that's because of a human, one of your employees clicked on a fish or gave out confidential information on a phone call um, or, you know, did some other behavior uh, that, uh, that really put you at risk. So uh, it's really important for employees to understand that security is their job too. So, and, you know, the communications team, uh, you know, the, however your organization may be structured, you know, there's different ways that you can reach the employees, but that's definitely um, a really important piece. And I think, um, especially when you've had a program uh, on as, as long as you have, uh, as long as we've had, just trying to be creative um, and grabbing employees' attention um, and tying into the latest security news. So, you know, Aaron, as I said earlier, he gave a lot of fantastic examples of really current uh, risks that are out there and make sure that you share that with your employees. Um, that, you know, there's, uh, you know, and COVID in particular has brought about all these new cyber attacks for people to watch out for. So make sure your employees are aware of that. So, um, you know, just the timeliness is, is really important. Um, uh, and just making sure that employees really do understand that they need to play a role in security. So I think the examples that we talked about earlier, the timeliness uh, also really um, kind of helps keep things fresh. One thing we didn't, ch um, we didn't talk about, Sonia, but to your point of making sure it's known that it's not IT's responsibility, um, it's everyone's, is a champions program. And I know that you guys have done that for many years. Um, some companies I see designate champions and they're all in IT. I think this is a missed opportunity. Um, I think champions can be IT people, but I would try to make it as diverse as possible and represent um, thought leaders within every area that can really help it resonate locally within departments or within specific business processes that may have nuances or may have more, more or less sensitive data than others. So um, champion programs can be elaborate, they can be very basic, but ultimately you want to build a community of, of not experts, but people that can ramp up their awareness to a higher level and be able to advocate for continued learning within their sphere of influence. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, security, having security champions embedded across your business uh, really can help as well. Um, and then Aaron, I think you alluded to this too, but I think uh, it's important to not, uh, to not put too much noise out there for your employees because your security 
um, awareness, security communications, you're competing against employees attention for a lot of other important programs. Maybe it's coming from HR or other groups. So you need to make sure you're uh, tied back with your communications department to really understand what messaging is going out to employees so that you're not stepping on each other's toes and you don't want to uh, confuse employees with too much information. So, you know, the timing sometimes can be really important. You may have something to go out, but maybe something else, another group in the company needs to get to employees. So you might need to be flexible on your timing when you're rolling out or sharing something to employees, uh, but also um, having a focus, uh, not trying to just throw every single thing out at employees on every single security topic. So uh, really customize and work with your security team, your IT team, however you're structured and understanding what are the biggest risks specifically to your organization and then how can we educate employees on those risks. Um, so that's really important too because there's so many different angles and topics you can take when it comes to cybersecurity, but uh, you really need to uh, try to focus and, and focus on those top risks that your business might be facing. Great advice and thank you both for all the great content. We'll actually be sending out a note with a lot of links to a lot of the great resources that Aaron and Sonia talked about today. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, we will be doing a blog recap and the recording will be available on our Shop Chats page um, that we can share in the chat here if you have not accessed that before. And if you'd like to suggest a future topic, um, we've had a lot of interesting topics and we wanna keep those going. So if you have um, a, a topic or a guest that in mind that you'd like to share, please, please let us know. We'd be, we'd be happy to explore that. Thanks again to Aaron and Sonia for your time and all the, the great content that you shared. Thanks so much, Stacey and team. Yes, thanks for having us. Have a great week. Definitely. Thanks. Thank you.